Good morning. morning. It's so good to see you all here today. I'm glad the weatherman was wrong. (laughs) You know, we've been talking about the evolution of consciousness the past few weeks, and we're coming toward the end of Reverend Robert Brummett's book, Birthing a Greater Reality, a Guide to Conscious Evolution. So when you think about evolution, most of us think about the theories, right? You have the theory of evolution, you have the theory of creation, and somewhere in the middle is the whole story. Well, one day, a zookeeper, and if you've seen the movie Zookeeper with Kevin James, one of my favorite, favorite actors and comedians, uh, you can identify with this. One day, the zookeeper noticed that the monkey was reading two books. He was reading the Bible, and Doran's The Origin of a Species. In surprise, he asked the ape, Where, why are you reading those books? Well, said the monkey, I just wanted to know if I was my brother's keeper or my keeper's brother. <laughs> <laughs> so you decide. Today is Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day to all of you. It's a very special day, and many people don't have someone they would call a valentine. But I have you to know that you are your own valentine. So I'm going to give you a little bit of the history, but first of all, I have to talk about one of my favorite, favorite places to be, Hallmark Cards. Now, I'm partial to Hallmark, not just because of Valentine's Day, but I love greeting cards. I seem to hear an echo. I love greeting cards, and maybe I'm a little more partial because it's a Kansas City company. And then another reason I'm partial is because I worked there when I was in the 10th grade. And it was hard work filling those orders. You had production, you had to pull everything off the shelves, you had to get it right. And I learned what a corgit is. Who in here knows what a corgit is? Yay, what's a corgit? It's a box that you fill the Liberty Distribution Center, which is probably where you work. I worked at, actually I worked before there was Crown Center. I worked at the original building down on Maine, but it's a box, and inside the box is a, a piece of cardboard, and that's where you put the, the make the, the, uh, the whole box more sturdy. Well, you had to do all that within a matter of seconds, and I still had to do my homework. So it was quite a job, but I loved it. I fell in love with Hallmark. I love everything Hallmark stands for, especially the logo. When you care enough to give the very best, Hallmark cards. Now, there are other competitors, and you know, I, I kind of like those too, but I love that when you care enough to give the very best. Another reason I like Hallmark is its diversity and inclusion program. There was an article in this week's Kansas City Star, it was on Tuesday, and it was by James Fussell, and he writes to Hallmark, love is love. Love is love. Hallmark puts spotlight on a diversity of love. The slogan is, how do you know when you've found the one? How do you know when you've found the one? These are videos featuring love stories of couples who are gay, lesbian, interracial, and of different ethnicities and ages. Hallmark really took a leap of faith because in the article it says some people wrote that they loved it and some people wrote, I can't stand it, I'll never shop Hallmark again. But me, I'll be forever indebted to Hallmark cards, whatever they do, and especially because of their diversity and inclusion program. It's wonderful to be included. You know, diversity is being invited to the dance, invited to the party, and inclusion is being asked to dance. So, I got this idea. In addition to this being the season of love, it's the season of nonviolence. It started with the birthday of Dr. King and it ends on April 4th with Gandhi. So it's the season of nonviolence, but it's also the Lenten season. And what do we think about when we think of Lent? We think of giving up something, you know, forgive, give up something for, forgiveness. I never do well at that. I I last maybe five days at the max of giving up sugar or giving up potato chips or giving up something. But I just don't make it the 40 days. I don't know how Jesus did it, but 40 days is a long time. (laughs) But the whole point of the 40-day experience, the Lenten experience, is not about the material things you can give up, the food, you know, the clothes or whatever. It's about forgiveness. So I found this idea that I think can, I can work with, and maybe some of you who, have, who are Lenten challenged can work with it too, and is to take something from your house, your, maybe my closet, that I no longer have need of or no longer serves its purpose or 
Maybe I just need to get, get, get it on to where it can do more good for someone else and put that aside. And so every day for 40 days, you take one thing and you set it aside. And at the end of the 40 days, you donate that to charity. How's that for a 40 day Lenten experience? I'm going to start working with Phil's shoes because he has a lot of shoes. <laughs> Once upon a time, there were two brothers who lived on adjoining, adjoining farms, and they fell into conflict. It was the first rift that they had ever had in 40 years of farming side by side, trading labor and goods as needed. Then the long collaboration fell apart, and it began with a very small misunderstanding. Isn't that how it always is? But it exploded into something of enormous proportions, exchange of bitter words, and finally, utter silence. They quit speaking to each other altogether. One morning, there was a knock on John's door, and he opened it to find a man with a carpenter's toolbox. I'm looking for a few days' work, he said. Perhaps you could have a few small jobs that I could do that I could help you out with. Yes, said the older brother. I do have a job for you. Look across the creek at that farm. That's my neighbor. In fact, that's my brother. Last week, there was a meadow between us, and he took his bulldozer to the river levee, and now there's a creek between us. Well. He may have done this to spite me, but I'll go him one better. See that pile of lumber curing over there? I want you to build me a fence, an eight-foot fence, so I won't need to see his place anymore. That'll cool him down anyhow. The carpenter said, I think I understand the situation. Show me the nails and the post hole digger, and I'll be able to do a job that pleases you. The older brother had to go to town for supplies, so he helped the carpenter get the materials ready, and then he was off for the day. The carpenter worked all day, measuring, sawing, and nailing. About sunset, when the farmer returned, the carpenter had just finished the job. The farmer's eyes opened wide and his jaw dropped. There was no fence at all. It was a bridge, a bridge stretching from one side of the creek to the other a fine piece of work, handrails and all, and the neighbor, the younger brother, was coming across with his hand outstretched. You are quite a fellow to build this bridge after all I've said and done. The two brothers stood at the end of the bridge and they met in the middle, taking each other's hand. They turned to see the carpenter hoist his toolbox on his shoulder. No, wait, stay for a few days. I have a lot more projects for you, the older brother said. I'd love to stay on, the carpenter said, but I have many more bridges to build. You see, love is about giving up something for. It's about forgiveness. Forgiveness and love go hand in hand. And Jesus was a carpenter, still building bridges in our lives. Mary Helen Doyle said, choose love and peace will follow. Choose peace and love will follow. Some 250 years after the birth of Jesus, a priest by the name of Valentine lived in Rome during the reign of Emperor Claudius. Claudius was committed to rebuilding the Roman army, and he believed it was important for men to volunteer instead of being drafted against their will. So given a choice, most of the Romans refused to sign up, preferring to stay home with their wives and their families rather than go off to battle. Claudius believed that only single men would volunteer, so he issued a royal command that banned marriages and outlawed weddings, earning him the nickname Claudius the Cruel. Valentine thought that this was ridiculous and secretly continued to perform marriage ceremonies, whispering the words while listening for soldiers on the steps outside. One night he heard the footsteps and the couple he was marrying escaped, but Valentine was caught thrown in jail and sentenced to death. Many young couples he had married came to visit him in jail. They threw flowers and notes to his window to let him know that they still believed in love. One of his frequent visitors happened to be the daughter of one of the guards. And the guard allowed her to spend all the time she wanted with Valentine. She would sit with him for hours and their friendship grew. On the day of his execution, he left her a note thanking her for her friendship and loyalty, and he signed it, love from your Valentine. It was written on the day he died, February 14th, 269 AD. A day that has been set aside to honor 
a man who gave his life for God and for love. The book of John, the 15th chapter, the 13th verse says, no greater love has anyone than this, than to lay down their life for a friend. The book of John uses the L word, love, 31 times. Now, how do we celebrate Valentine's Day? You know, we go all out. Hallmark didn't originate the Valentine's card. I thought they did. I'm still giving them the credit. <laughs> the practice began in England and Europe in the 1800s. Today, more than half of the population of the United States celebrates by giving cards. It's the second most popular card giving time of the year in this country. With 150 million cards sold on Valentine's Day or around Valentine's Day each year, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. Oh, but should I have bought stock in, in Hallmark when I was in 10th grade? <laughs> flowers are the second gift that we often give. Roses are third in receipts of all cut flowers. And candy, oh, chocolate. I tried giving up chocolate for Lent once. I lasted five minutes. <laughs> chocolate in particular is a one and a half billion dollar industry on Valentine's Day alone. Jewelry, some of you get jewelry. Three and a half billion dollars is spent in the United States on jewelry for this day. 1.6 billion for clothing and 3.4 billion dining out. Those are nice gifts. They last, they're one day, one day. We spend all this time and men are the worst. They spend the most in this country and they procrastinate. Some of them are not here today. See these empty seats? Those are the men who are out trying to buy that last minute Valentine's gift. <laughs> So I'm not talking to you about those kinds of material gifts. I want to talk to you about the greatest gift of all. We say it every Sunday when we bless our gifts. We say divine love, divine love through me blesses and multiplies all that I give and all that I receive. Divine love, the greatest gift of all. We say it at the close of the service in the prayer of protection. We say the love of God enfolds me. Divine love. We have a window. I hope you look at that when you come in and watch it and pay attention to that. That is a powerful statement. Just those, that four-letter word, love, is the most powerful statement. The five-pointed star represents the five main ministries at Unity Temple on the Plaza. Prayer. Seek first the kingdom of God. Healing out of prayer always comes healing from the inside out. Education. Standing on the foundation of prayer and healing to share our experience with the world. Worship, following the law in spirit and in truth. And community, loving one another as God loves us so deeply. The five ministries, prayer, healing, education, worship, and community. The word love beneath the star is the foundation of each of these ministries. The flame in the center of the star represented our, represents our illuminated consciousness, a greater reality birthed in us, the Christ, the I am in expression at the center of our being. You are the light of the world. When you look at that flame, let it remind you, I am the light of the world. The star represents all humanity, every one of us. The points around the star represent the 12 disciples, the 12 powers in each of us, according to Charles Fillmore. The power for this month is represented by the disciple Andrew, which stands for strength. And I want to fast forward to the disciple for, or the power for April. I was born in April. That power is represented by the disciple John, who tells us all about love throughout that book in the Bible, and he represents strength. Strength and love go together. When I was thinking about this, I was reminded of Dr. King's book that became one of his most popular publications. It's a summary of almost all of his sermons that he finished compiling while in the Birmingham jail in 1963. Strength to love. He and Reverend Ralph Abernathy were jailed because they were leading a prayer vigil outside the courthouse in Albany, Georgia. And while he was in jail, he, began, he decided he would finish writing the work that he had started in 1957. 
Of all the books he wrote, according to his wife, Coretta, people consistently told her that this one changed their life. She said she believed it was because this book best explains the central element of Dr. King's philosophy of his belief in a divine, loving presence that binds all of us together, that hints at the personal transformation at the root of social justice, that by reaching into and beyond ourselves and tapping the transcendent moral ethic of love, we shall overcome. Dr. King is saying that love is the great overcomer. His work reflected his deep understanding of the need for agape, a love that is concerned with going the extra mile to ensure the well-being of all humankind. Now, we know that racism still exists in this country and in many parts of the world. Dr. King's mission of unconditional love through nonviolent protest helped to change the consciousness of people all around this globe. As he said, hatred paralyzes, love releases it. Hatred confuses, love harmonizes it. Hatred darkens, love illumines it. Nearly every culture puts their credence on love. It is a common thread of many of the world's religious traditions. Jesus told us, love one another. Simple as that, love one another. The Hebrew scriptures the Jews followed love's way this way. You shall love the Lord with all your God and all your heart and all your soul and all your might. They're talking about the strength that it takes to love. The Hindu said, show love to all creatures and thou wilt be happy. For when you lovest all things, thou lovest the Lord. For he is all in all. The Buddhist tradition says, if you truly love yourself, you could never hurt another. In 1953, a British physician by the name of Dr. John Bowlby published findings on the life-giving power of love. Some of you may have heard this story. He observed infants and toddlers in orphanages who were not developing physically and mentally. He determined that they were being kept well. They were well fed and they were kept warm and their basic needs were tended to. They were being kept clean. But what he noticed was that due to the heavy workload in these orphanages and short staffs, they weren't being picked up or cuddled or played with. And he surmised that this was one of the underlying causes of their lack of development mentally and physically. So he proposed some changes to the practices in those orphanages. And after a while, with the children getting more undivided attention, being held and loved and talked to and read to, things began to change. And they noticed that the children were growing and developing more physically and mentally in ways that they should. For Dr. Bowlby, this was an affirmation of the need for human contact, for tenderness and love. It wasn't a commentary on those babies and those toddlers because, see, we're all born with the ability to love. We are all born in the image and likeness of God, and God is love. But to survive, grow, and thrive, we need to be able to express that love. And those babies and little children had no way to show their love. They had no way to receive it or to give it. And love is a two-way street. When we give expression to it, love enables us to grow into what God created us to be. In The Revealing Word, Charles Fillmore defines this love as undoubtedly the most beautiful of all the attributes of God. He says, in divine mind, the power, love is the power that joins and binds divine harmony with the universe and everything and everyone in it. Love is not concerned with who or what it loves nor with a return to love. Like the sun, its joy is in the shining forth of its nature. Divine love will bring your own to you. It will just all misunderstandings, like the two brothers and the bridge, and make your life and affairs happy, healthy, harmonious, and free. Last Sunday, if you were here, you heard Reverend Robert Brummett, author of the book 
that Duke and I and Nian have been sharing with you all the past several weeks. He talked about the evolutionary impulse that gave birth to the universe, and he said it will never go away. He said this world has developed incredible knowledge, but we are lacking in wisdom and compassion. And he challenged us to become conscious of our own evolution in order to survive. What Reverend Brummett was saying is something we've been hearing forever. We hear it in our songs. What the world needs now is love. Not just for some, but for everyone. To achieve this evolution of consciousness, we must be first willing to let go of the ego, our attachment to our minds. That's brought us this far in evolution. But in order to better understand who we are and to harness the power of unconditional love, we need to move beyond that. Teilhard de Chardin said, man can harness the winds, the waves, and the tides, but when he can harness the power of love, then for the second time in the history of the world, man will have discovered fire. The power of love begins inside of us. You don't need to go shopping for it. You cannot find it in the stores. It's not online. It's in you. Alan Cohen said, wouldn't it be powerful if you fell in love with yourself so deeply that you would do just about anything if you knew it would make you happy? The deeper you love yourself, the more the universe will affirm your words. Then you can enjoy a lifelong love affair that brings you the richest fulfillment from the inside out. As is said, and as you heard the choir sing in Corinthians 13, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am nothing. We can give all the Valentines we want, but if we don't love ourselves, it is of no use. This is the evolution of consciousness about which we speak. It's all about love. Learning to love yourself is the greatest gift of all. Learning to love yourself is the greatest gift of all. I invite you to take that phrase deep into your consciousness as we go into meditation. Learning to love yourself is the greatest gift of all.